Lord Bryan, welcome to Bloomberg. Thank you. Um, timely moment for you uh, and for us. We have this movement in the oil market. We have this great coalescing between OPEC and non-OPEC. I'm just wondering to get your take. Is this a smart move? Is this pragmatism personified? Well, it's an important move for OPEC, obviously, to see if the supply of oil can be moderated. However, there is a very large amount of oil around, <laughs> and it takes a lot of activity to moderate that supply. Uh, people have tried in the past, uh, not to say the past is uh, always a good indicator, but last time there was a very large amount of supply, prices, this was uh, in the mid-80s, mm -hmm. Uh, prices came down and people adapted to low prices to such an extent that the supply was pretty well uh, well overhang uh, for 17 years. There was one number that struck me quite interesting. Compliance. This time around, compliance in OPEC, and the Saudis are doing their bit, was nearly 96% on this deal. Does that surprise you? It doesn't. Uh, it's very good to see that people are much more in tune with the data. In the past, uh, it wasn't as transparent as it is today, so people are aware of everybody watching them, uh, and they, they, they keep in compliance. It's important for them to see if they can reduce the overhang of supply, but it's a big challenge. Big trying, to challenge. trying to rebalance that market, I, I suppose really what I'm trying to get to, I'm, I'm off to OPEC next week, so I'm going to chase around uh, a, a few ministers. You've been around a while. Has OPEC lost its swagger? We wrote an article that you could have fatigue, fatigue uh, with OPEC promises. Would you agree? Has it lost its swagger? No, I think OPEC is st still alive and well. Uh, its obituary has been written many, many times. <laughs> uh, but it's alive and well, uh, and it tries to uh, manage the market uh, and give at least the market some stability. It, it can do it if uh, it's on the margin adjustments. But this is much more than the margin. Uh, we have a big supply. We have technology attuned to lower prices, producing more supply, notably unconventional, but also in the offshore. Are you surprised, do you think the oil industry is surprised at the efficiency of the frackers? Because they are aggressive. Of course. People are very surprised. I mean, if you went back 10 years ago, people would uh, have said, well, it's an interesting marginal bit of activity, not something which has revolutionized the supply of oil in the world. And it's still at its rough beginning. There's plenty more to do. Do you think they can squeeze even more efficiently? They can certainly squeeze uh, more technical efficiency. The cost may go up because the supply chain is being pulled in, being stressed. But technically, uh, there's more to go. Technically, there's more to come. I'm curious to know, the Russians and OPEC. Why do you think there's this grand coalition, this rapprochement between the two? Why now? What's driving it? Well, it's never clear, of course, but I would expect, again, the mutual advantage is to get the price of oil up uh, and to make sure that uh, it's stabilised. Clearly, it's a very important part of the revenue base of Russia. Their margin has much improved because the ruble has uh, devalued and therefore uh, the cost base has gone down. But nonetheless, revenue matters a lot. You spent a bit of time in the US, quite a bit of time in the US. I'm curious, how optimistic is US oil about Donald Trump and the prospect for big change? How optimistic are the oil men and women in the United States? Well, I think the first thing is the oil men and women in the United States have been optimistic with good reason for a bit of time. They've got the, uh, the, the Permian and other uh, unconventional basins going well, doing more, finding uh, extraordinary value. Uh, they've got people joining the industry. A and so all of that's doing a great deal for the industry. So they were optimistic anyway. I'm sure they're optimistic with any uh, administration that says we'll reduce taxes. It's a very good thing. And as a, as a chairman and as a CEO, do you think that that's what goes through the cogs of the mind of every CEO in the US? It's the tax incentive that they might get. Is that, do you think, what's driving? Well, no, I, I think a lot of CEOs, and, and I know them well, think about things in a much more sustainable way. You know, when you're dealing in the oil and gas business, even in the shale, where you can mm -hmm. turn off and turn on investment, actually you're thinking about things 
almost beyond a one administration. You've got to think about things of what's sustainable, what can I bank on as I start putting billions of dollars on the ground. And that's what I think people are... So they aim off. You know, the great statements are always aimed off. They like to hear them, but they like to see them delivered. Um, one of the big issues globally is Russia. Um, the nuances of which we could spend much more time talking about. But in terms of Russia coming in from the cold, in terms of as you read the tea leaves of geopolitics at the moment, where are we? What is your interpretation of the world's perspective of Russia and Putin? Well, as the oil industry, of course, it's always been one of the top three. It had a very bad moment uh, when, it, uh, when it changed its... The, when the marketization of uh, Russia took place. But ever since then, and, and certainly when BP was involved uh, at the very beginning, uh, Russia's been one of the top three uh, uh, in the oil industry, and I'm sure it wants to maintain that position. It was interesting that for many years it was the major calling card of Russia to the world. What about energy? I think that's less of a calling card today because there are more sources and more openness. So the calling card of Russia has to be its general position in the world as a, as a power that's been and a power intends to maintain. Finally, Lord Brown, I want to get your opinion on, on Brexit. Theresa May talks about a strong and stable government as she goes to the polls. Um, you have negotiated many deals in your lifetime with a whole variety of institutions and people. As you look at the Brexit negotiations, talk to me about the opportunity. What's the most important opportunity for us? Because we spent a great deal of time talking about the negatives of hard Brexit. Your perspective? Well, the first, the most important thing is we've decided to, to leave for Europe, so now we must make the very best of that decision. You voted it's, to remain? I voted to remain, but uh, now that we've decided to leave, we must now make it really work. Uh, and it's a statement of the obvious, but so important to say, you have to find the points of mutual advantage between us and the rest of Europe, and we need to find that very quickly. For us, I think, as a nation that's lived on its wits for a very long part of its history, you know, we are, after all, a, a resource-poor nation, really, in, in the middle of the sea. We've lived on our wits, our trading wits, our innovation wits, and our financial wits. So we must make sure that the people involved in that, the great uh, financial centre we have here, the great science and technology centres, and the people associated with that feel comfortable and stay here and actually grow. Because without that, then we begin to lose. So everything must be done to maintain and expand our, our advantage and make it mutual for Europe.